All right, so let's take a look then at chapter 5. In chapter 5, we really kind of honed in on electrons. I mean, you're probably getting sick of hearing about electrons and just me kind of beating this into your brain about the significance of electrons, why they matter, why they matter, why they matter. Um, and really, before we even kind of explained electrons and how they work and where they are and all that business and the or different types of orbitals, first we need to explain a little bit about what they do. And we explain this through uh, doing the, the lab with light and spectroscopy. Um, where the section was called quantized, light and quantized energy. And what we did is we took kind of an overall approach of what is light. And we use light to kind of explain the idea here. And we looked at light as either a wave or a particle. And that particle is what we now refer to as the photon. We use that a lot. We use that terminology a lot. And that's just saying we're talking about a single individual particle of wave, a little piece of a wave, or a little, excuse me, a little piece of light. Um, but we also talked a lot about the nature of waves. And the thing is, light waves are the same as any other waves, except the fact they go really, really fast. But a light wave is a wave is a wave. And we talked about... Um, the idea of how we see frequency of this wave, there it has a set frequency and it has a set wavelength. And that frequency and that wavelength are directly related to one another, but in a unique way. And the idea is that with frequency and wavelength, which frequency is answering the question of how often it goes by, <coughs> And wavelength is simply looking at the length of the wave, the length or the size. Well, you can see that if you take the wave and you squish it down, you pack it together, you make a smaller wavelength, you're going to see it go by more often. And conversely, if you stretch the wave out and make it bigger, the wave is not going to go by nearly as often. So what we see is these are oppositely related to one another. When frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. When wavelength goes up, frequency goes down. They are opposites. Um, because the speed between that explains them does not change. Light moves at a constant speed. All right. So that was a little bit about the nature of um, it as a wave. When we looked at this more in terms of a photon of light, Uh, we looked at a couple different things here. First off, we talked a little bit about the overall idea of the energy it caused that we get from a photon. That it has some sort of inherent energy because it's moving. If it's moving, it has to have kinetic energy. And you can use that kinetic energy to do stuff. Lots of stuff. For example, if you take a photon and you send it down here and you run it into something, like, I don't know, a solid chunk of silicone, it does something very important because that solid chunk of metal is going to have little electrons all over its surface. And when that photon comes in and delivers its energy to this and strikes the surface, bloop, out shoots an electron. And that electron that comes out of there then becomes very, very useful because now we have a moving electron which is what we know today as electricity. That is electric current is a flow or a stream of these electrons. Right? This concept here, the use of this energy, is something we call the photoelectric effect. This is the thing that won uh, Albert Einstein, his Nobel Prize, his one and only Nobel Prize, even though he had lots of other great ideas. This is the one that earned him a Nobel Prize. And of course, a great application for this today would be like, say, a solar panel. We use this to um, power uh, devices when they're not near an electric, a, the electrical grid. Very often we use that. It's not we haven't come up with a very efficient way to make a lot of electricity out of them yet. That's one of the things that people are working on. A cheap, effective way to make this work better would definitely go a long ways. It's my personal prediction that in about 10 or 15 years from now, any time a house is built, the house will be built in, with shingles, and then on top of your shingles, we will put on a layer of the solar panels, a photoelectric-sensitive 
layer on top of your roof that will provide electricity for your house. In much the same way now that any time a house is built, we build it with plumbing and we build it with central heat and air. I think we're not far from utilizing the photoelectric effect on every house that's built. I think that will become a very common thing uh, in not far from now. Um, but anyways, very useful. Um, the photoelectric effect also shows up in digital cameras um, in lots of applications. But really, the big one I think is going to end up being solar panels. Um, but the question though then is, well, how much energy do you get? How much energy comes into this thing? And it turns out, the energy is directly related to really only one thing. The energy of a photon is directly related to its frequency of that electron. And the energy that we get out of that photon is usually written this way as H times F or H times nu, whichever way you abbreviate frequency. But the H is just a constant. In fact, it's Planck's constant. And it's just a number, right? So the only thing that really determines, or the thing that can most directly determine how much energy that individual little photon has to deliver is the frequency of the light. So red light, for example, has less energy than a green light or blue light, that sort of stuff. And then, of course, gamma, you know, if we look at the spectrum, the whole entire electromagnetic spectrum, radio waves have the lowest amount of energy which is why you can go outside and you're bombarded with radio waves and it does not affect you because there's radio waves everywhere around you. Whereas gamma rays are incredibly high energy and would destroy your DNA very quickly if you were exposed to a lot of high energy gamma rays. So some of them are more dangerous than others and it's all related to frequency is the thing that really ends up mattering here. Okay, um, and the application we did in the lab was this thing we called spectra. In particular, we did uh, emission spectra. And emission spectra just means that we're talking about something that is being emitted off of this. And what causes this emission spectra? Well, we, we took a device called spectra uh, in, to look at the spectrum. We had a little tube... And inside of it, we had some sort of a gas source that was glowing inside of here. And it was glowing because we passed a lot of electricity into this thing. And then the electricity that goes into the material in this gas, and let's go back to my helium model here for a second. Um, um, the... The idea is that when we pat, put a lot of electricity into this, we put a lot of energy into it, these electrons do not stay where they are. They move from their, what we call their ground state, out to what we call the excited state. And it, they do not stay at the excited state very long because the nucleus will eventually pull those electrons back in, and as they move back to their ground state, they have to release some energy. That energy that is released as they move back is the photon of light. That photon is going to have a very specific frequency, and that specific frequency is part of the ultimate color that we saw coming off of these things. So then all you need to do is to take all the photons that are being shot out at different wavelengths and have a way to split them up. So these photons that are coming out can be broken apart by a, uh, the little glasses that I gave you guys. And then you can be able to see the different colors coming off of this thing. Those, so those emission spectra were ultimately caused by those photons that are ejected as the electron goes back to its ground state. So that was kind of the big uh, lab thing that we did where we tried to identify some unknowns. Um, the next thing that we looked at in Chapter 5 about... Dealing with uh, electrons is where we spent a lot, uh, a good chunk of time, was dealing with the configuration. We spent a lot of time looking at how those electrons are set up around 
the particular nucleus for each individual atom, and there's a lot of different things that we learned about. First and foremost, we learned that there are four different, well, before we even get into the shapes, there are different energy levels. And usually when we see the simple model that I've been drawing like for helium, we're only drawing the energy levels. We don't draw, we don't take into shape the other part of this. But the different energy level is the period number on the periodic table. One, as we go down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, the different periods are described by the energy levels. All right? Then there are also four unique shapes or styles. And those four unique shapes and styles end up being an important factor in what decides the periodic table, at least the overall layout. So we have S, we have P's, we have D's, and we have F's, the four different types. The S orbitals can hold the, each of these are really determined, they make a shape, but also they are an important characteristic that tells us how many electrons can be in that section. The S orbitals, of course, holding two. The P orbital being able to hold six. The D type orbitals, maximum layer of 10. And F, we get to 14. So S, P, D, F, 2, 6, 10, and 14. And the number of electrons they can hold ends up playing an important role in a lot of things. Um, I'm going to ask you to be able to use this idea of S, P's, D's, and F's to write out electron configurations for a couple of different elements. So for example, if I gave you nitrogen, if I said what is the electron configuration for nitrogen, you would need to know how to do this in terms of writing it and the number of electrons per orbital in order. So nitrogen we would say first it has the 1s2, then we would say it has 2s2, and then 2p3. And then the, what we're looking at here is we're saying that it has Two electrons in the first, two in this the 2s, and then three in the 3p, and that makes our seven electrons because nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. So it's going to have seven electrons. I'm also going to ask you to do it the other way, which is noble gas form. So if we wanted to look at, uh, let's say, sodium. Sodium is element number 11. And so that conveniently falls right after a noble gas. A noble gas, it has most directly passed in order, is argon. So we could write this as argon and then 3s1, because that is the only other electron it has. It has 1 in the 3s orbital. And that's it. So that is the way that you would write that in the notation for noble gas form. You will be asked to do that on at least a couple different ones to be able to show you know how to do electron configuration. You may have any will questions have on that one? Well, we have a periodic table in front of us. Yes, you will be allowed to have a periodic table. I'm not going to ask you to memorize the periodic table. So basically, each one starts with two S's. Yes. And then goes on to P's. And so not on. always. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, would it not go directly from S into P? When it goes to D. Right, there's a D in there, because the D's, the D block makes up that middle transition area. So you just have to go in order on the periodic table, and if you know the four blocks, which we'll talk about in a second, that ends up being a huge tool in being able to do the electron configuration for them. Okay, so then what we're going to do, after we know the, uh, coming up with the electron configuration, uh, that is really the end of chapter 5. So, 